I am so excited to welcome to the show James Acton. He is the co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. James, it's so great to meet you. Well, thank you very much for having me on today. I'm delighted to be here. Can we start with just a little bit about your your academic background and training so folks uh, know what it takes to be an expert on alleged space nukes? Um, so I am a physicist by training originally. Uh, I have a uh, PhD in theoretical physics that was a, a long time ago now, I wow. should add. Uh, when I was doing the PhD, I enjoyed reading uh, foreign affairs a lot more than physical review in the evening. Um, and uh, I've been working in the policy arena for about in, in nuclear policy for about uh, 17 years. Uh, I joined uh, the Carnegie Endowment for two years, and that was 15 years ago. Uh, and um, uh, have been here ever since, most recently as co-director of the program. It's always fun for me. Like in politics, you know, there's people who are great politicians or great strategists. Um, but you could kind of imagine yourself maybe doing those jobs. I love meeting folks where there's just absolutely no way I could get a PhD in physics, no matter, you give me a billion years to try. Um, there's no chance I would pass that. So credit to you. Uh, so, okay, we're here today, thanks to a, a cryptic statement from Congressman Mike Turner. He is the chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. He said, quote, Today, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence has made available to all members of Congress information concerning a serious national security threat. I'm requesting that President Biden declassify all information relating to this threat so that Congress, the administration, and our allies can openly discuss the actions necessary to respond to this threat. Now, Congressman Turner is smart enough to know that his statement, along with making all this intelligence available to members of Congress, would send every single reporter in Washington chasing after this intelligence and basically de facto begin the process of declassifying it. So I guess maybe that was his plan here. Um, the reporting here so far suggests that this is either intelligence about a satellite killing nuclear weapon or a nuclear powered satellite of sorts that has some sort of ele electronic warfare capability. So I was thinking we could take them one at a time. Um, James, why do you think one might want or need a nuclear weapon to take out a satellite? Couldn't a non-nuclear weapon work as well? Sure. Um, so, you know, this is the, this is the, one of the interpretations is this is a nuclear weapon that Russia would place in orbit. Maybe it does it during peacetime, so it's there and ready during a conflict. I think that's kind of unlikely. Uh, another possibility is that it puts it in during a conflict when it thinks it might need it. That strikes me as being more possible. Um, and this is the, you know, the New York Times reported yesterday, this was uh, uh, what it was. It was a nuclear weapon that would go in orbit in space. Um, I, you know, we'll get onto this. There, had, there was directly contradictory reporting to that, but let's pursue this theory for the time being. So Russia has a pretty active uh, non-nuclear anti-satellite program, hmm. it has various different capabilities uh, for destroying satellites without nuclear weapons. You ask, well, why would you might want to do it with a nuclear weapon? I can think of three possible reasons, uh, which aren't necessarily mutually exclusive to one. The first one is you just don't have very much confidence in your non-nuclear anti-satellite program, hmm. uh, or at least there's parts of the different orbits that you think you can't reach, uh, uh, are out of reach of your non-nuclear capabilities, of which Russia has various types. So one possibility is basically your existing capabilities are limited in some way. A second possibility, and this is kind of speculative, but it kind of makes sense to me, is the US military is increasingly thinking about so-called proliferated constellations. These are satellite constellations that have large numbers of small satellites in them. Starlink is the most famous one of right. those. The US military uses that. But the US military is also developing its own proliferated constellations for exclusively military purposes. So Starlink is like a bunch of little satellites all over the place instead of a couple really big, powerful ones, right? Exactly. Right and Starlink, Starlink is a communications constellation. It's used for communications. The US military is thinking about developing its own communication satellites uh, 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 in this proliferated architecture. Uh, other proliferated architectures for other kinds of purposes as well. One thing a nuke is potentially really good at is destroying a whole load of satellites at once. Um, and so, you know, maybe if Russia is very worried about these proliferated constellations, um, it thinks that nuclear weapons in space are a potentially good way of destroying multiple satellites at once. 
Um, and then a third possible reason is it's kind of the Russian military industrial complex out of control. Um, you know, somebody in the system is like, you know, why don't we put a nuclear weapon in space? That'll be a good way to scare the Americans and destroy satellites. And right now, you know, nobody wants or is able to stop them. Um, you know, those are three possible reasons. All of them or none of them could be correct, but they all seem plausible to me. If someone were to detonate a nuclear weapon in space, would that pose a threat to people back on Earth uh, from radiation or fallout? Um, it's going to depend a lot on the altitude of the nuclear weapon. Um, the, the higher altitude you go, um, the less the effects on Earth are likely to be. The biggest effect for people on Earth, by the way, is the so-called electromagnetic pulse. This is this huge pulse of electromagnetic radiation um, that uh, is created, uh, particularly when you detonate a nuclear weapon, uh, a little bit above the densest part of the atmosphere. Um, you know, I, I, I believe it's kind of something in excess of 40 kilometers. Um, if you're kind of in that region of space, you can create this intense electromagnetic pulse that knocks out a whole load of uh, electronic equipment on Earth. Wow. Um, there was a famous U.S. test called Starfish Prime that did this. Um, I think it impacted Hawaii, if I remember rightly. Um, the higher up in altitude you go, the less effect you're going to have on the Earth. There certainly have been some very high altitude nuclear detonations historically that really didn't have much effect, if any at all, uh, on, on, on Earth. So, you know, a lot would depend here on Russia's concept of operations, um, you know, how it intended to use this weapon. Based on some of the reporting we had yesterday, your guess is as good as mine, how correct it is. The focus really does appear to be U.S. concerns about Russia using this capability against satellites rather than against any kind of uh, terrestrial target. Got it. And th this might be a very dumb question. I have not seen Oppenheimer yet even. But do nuclear weapons work the same in space? Like, for example, does it create a shockwave if, if there's no atmosphere? Yeah, not not a dumb question at all. So, I mean, the answer is the nuclear explosion itself works differently in space. Um, but the uh, effects of the nuclear weapon are different in space from Earth. I mean, one of the things that you mentioned is if you have a huge explosion in a vacuum, you're not creating this massive shockwave, this huge amount of pressure. Uh, on the other hand, there are still effects of nuclear weapons um, that um, uh, uh, happen with space-based detonations. I mean, you're still creating intense amounts of energy, these gamma rays, uh, which basically, if you're close enough, could fry satellites. Uh, it turns out you can generate um, um, a, uh, an electromagnetic pulse in satellites, which is actually generated in the body of the satellite itself, uh, rather than by interactions of the nuclear explosion with the atmosphere. So the physics of this is quite different. Uh, in, incidentally, this, the person who wrote the single most accessible account of all of this uh, was the late Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. Uh, when he was a young academic, before he went into government, he did a lot of work on um, nuclear command and control systems and their survivability. And I was revising some of what he wrote last night when all of this came out again. Well, yeah, I used to work, uh, got to work with Ash back in the days. A brilliant, brilliant person. Uh, okay, so we, we talked about there's been you know, two very uh, distinct and different strands of reporting here. I believe it was Nick Schifrin told uh, PBS that his reporting suggests that this capability Russia may have is actually a nuclear-powered satellite that has electronic warfare capabilities that can be used to take out U.S. military or civilian satellites. Could you talk a bit about what the advantages are of, of using nuclear power for a, a weapon like that and what the risks are? Sure. So in terms of um, the nuclear powered satellite theory, let me first say I find both of these theories plausible. I have no dog in this fight about which one, if either of them is correct. But prima facie, here, I find them both entirely plausible. So I guess the idea here is that a nuclear reactor and we're not, you know, for those uh, listeners who are kind of acquainted in this, you may be aware that historically, um, even today, radioactive sources are used to power satellites and space probes. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an actual honest to God nuclear reactor in space. This is a very small nuclear reactor. It's relatively low powered. You don't need all that shielding, all the huge amounts of mass. 
But we are talking about a nuclear reactor in space. And I, full disclosure, I did not know this until last night, but the Soviet Union launched 30-something nuclear reactors in space. The United States launched one nuclear reactor into space. Huh. This is, in fact, something that's been done before. The big advantage of nuclear reactors is you could deliver a lot of power by the standards of stuff in space for a long period of time. And I think this is pretty good for something like jamming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you can have a satellite in space that can emit a ton of electromagnetic radiation and it could jam or it could damage in some way, undermine the operations of other satellites, uh, potentially in a very large volume of space, um, I can understand crazy, but like I can understand why that's attractive from a Russian perspective. Hmm. So, you know, I think it is. Um, uh, uh, you know, I don't know which, if either of these routes they're going down, but this idea of a nuclear powered satellite to conduct uh, electromagnetic warfare against US satellites. Again, this strikes me as being a plausible uh, strain of reporting on this. Yeah. So let, let's just say one of these two scenarios plays out and Russia uses this new weapon to either temporary or temporarily or fully take out a bunch of US military satellites or communication satellites. Can you just paint a picture in broad strokes of what the impact would be? Sure. So I think a lot depends here on how many satellites the Russians succeed in taking out. Um, concern about whether or not US satellites can survive in a conflict is something that is a, over the last decade, two decades, has been an ever bigger concern for the US military. And in, you know, in large part, um, what's part of what's, this is exactly what's motivating uh, US military interest in these proliferated constellations with lots of small satellites, is they're just much more resilient. They're much harder to destroy hmm. than uh, these traditional sparse constellations with just a few really big satellites in. So, you know, a lot is going to depend on the effectiveness of Russian weapons. How many satellites can you take out simultaneously? But, you know, the bottom line is if Russia can significantly degrade the performance of U.S. satellite constellations, and that, that's an if, like I'm not speculating on how good Russian capabilities are. But if Russia can degrade that, that would have huge implications for the U.S. ability to fight a conventional war. Um, or a nuclear war for that matter. You know, a huge US advantage in warfare comes from space. The ability to collect information and to transmit information, intelligent satellites uh, of all different varieties, uh, things like precision navigation and timing, mm -hmm. uh, which is a uh, code essentially for GPS, know knowing exactly where stuff is in the world. Huge advantage for accuracy. Uh, communications, both for receiving information and sending orders. Um, to the extent that Russia can successfully undermine all of that, uh, it significantly levels the playing field in a conflict. Now, I don't want to underplay the difficulty of undermining all of this, to use the term I just used, right? We're dealing with large numbers of satellites. They're in different orbits. They have mm -hmm. different vulnerabilities, um, you know, significantly degrading satellites is potentially a pretty tricky thing, at least without the use of nuclear weapons. Um, but, um, you know, if Russia could do that, then it would you know, level the playing field significantly. And alternative means for transmitting information, which I think are mostly pretty classified, you know, there are alternatives, they could be put in place, but they're probably not going to be nearly as good as satellites. Um, you know, there's two other aspects to mention here, and these are two escalation aspects. You know, one is the use of nuclear weapons in space is still the use of nuclear weapons, right? right? If Russia uses a nuclear weapon in space, we are then in a nuclear war at that point. Right. Um, and it wouldn't be as escalatory as using a nuclear weapon on Earth, but nobody should be under any illusions that Russia will have crossed the nuclear threshold. And then secondly, and kind of relatedly, and this is kind of an area of my own research, but there are some satellites that are used for both nuclear and non-nuclear command and control. Hmm. You know, they're used to transmit orders for conventional forces and for nuclear forces, for example. If those satellites were destroyed by, say, this nuclear-powered jamming system, 
even if Russia's goal was exclusively to try to win or not lose the conventional war, those attacks would still degrade the US nuclear command and control infrastructure. And that could also have escalation implications. Uh, even though there wouldn't be the use of a nuclear weapon, the degradation, perhaps unintended, of the US nuclear command and control infrastructure um, is still to kind of, quote the president, a big effing deal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you take away our ability to to respond and deter a nuclear attack, that is a huge deal. And to your point, I mean, if, if folks want to see firsthand how important satellite communications are to a modern military, look at how critical Starlink has been to the Ukrainian forces in their fight against Russia. I mean, it's absolutely necessary for them to win. Um, look, and again, I'm a novice on this. My understanding is whatever Russia might be planning it should be banned by the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Is that accurate? And can you give us a sense of what that does? So not quite. Okay. The nuclear powered uh, satellite, you know, the satellite powered by a nuclear reactor is not prohibited by the Outer Space Treaty. Got it. Um, both the US and Russia have launched um, nuclear powered satellites. I think the US launch was before the Outer Space Treaty, but some of the Russian launches were after. There was never any accusations of non-compliance with the Outer Space Treaty. The nuclear power, the nuclear weapon in space may or may not be a violation of the Outer Space Treaty, depending on how Russia uses it. The Outer Space Treaty prohibits the placement of nuclear weapons in orbit. Developing a nuclear weapon that could go into orbit, for better or for worse, is not a violation of the treaty. One maybe can argue it's bad faith, but actually there's a bunch of treaties that if they want to prohibit development, actually say so specifically. The Outer Space Treaty doesn't mention development. It's placing a nuke in orbit. If Russia were to put this weapon into space in peacetime, and it orbited around the Earth, definite violation of the Outer Space Treaty. If Russia placed a nuclear weapon in conflict before it wanted to use it and it orbited around the Earth, that would be a violation of the Outer Space Treaty, though if we were in the middle of a war against Russians and they were putting nukes in space, I think we'd have bigger problems than their violation of the Outer Space Treaty. If Russia put a nuke in space and before it completed one orbit, it used it, under the U.S. interpretation, that would not be a violation of the Outer Space Treaty. Yeah. Um, this goes back to a compliance dispute many years ago, but like, and, and, and physicists and engineers hate this, but like the current U.S. legal interpretation, which I think is technically dubious, but is what the lawyers came up with previously, which is if you use a nuclear weapon in orbit before it completes one orbit, then it hasn't been placed, quote, in orbit. So, <laughs> Wow, quite a loophole. You know, <laughs> I, I, I mean, listen, it was a funny thing. It was the Russians developed, the Soviets developed a system that put a nuke in. This was a ground attack system. It was a fractional orbital bombardment system that went into orbit, went round for half a revolution or whatever, and then came down again. Hmm. And basically, the U.S. didn't want a compliance dispute. So the U.S. interpreted the Open Skies Treaty in a way that was favorable to the Soviets. Um, it's like this completely bizarre episode. Now, I'm not sure we should have done that at the time. And State Department lawyers can say we've changed our mind about what the interpretation is. But that was the interpretation based on this Soviet system from, I think, the late 70s. But my timing may be off here. Got it. it, it is this one of these instances where we are learning about this uh, technological advancement or potential capability from the Russians and we're outraged by it? But the odds are pretty high that the Chinese are working on similar things, that the U.S. is secretly working on similar things. I mean, is this is this the next arms race, do you think? So two thoughts. Firstly, I don't regard this as massively high technology. I mean, putting a nuke in space is not high technology. If we wanted to do it, we could do it. Mm -hmm. Sensibly, we don't want to do it. But this is not all that difficult. Putting a nuclear reactor in space is something, you know, the U.S. is funding research in that area at the moment. It was something we did, I want to say, in the late 50s or early 60s. We we had that one nuclear reactor in space. So, you know, again, we could do this if we wanted to. Um, I would say this is an area in which the U.S. wants to achieve the same goals in a different way. The U.S. has become increasingly open, though it's still pretty opaque but that it, we do have an interest in an offensive counter space capability. That is, you know, we want to be able to threaten or 
degrade the operation of or temporarily damage whatever the exact goal is, Russian and Chinese and other state satellites. I don't think we would, I don't think there is any secret plan in the US to do that via a nuke in space. I, 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 I I just think there's much better ways of achieving that goal for us. Got it. Is it possible there's a classified program on thinking about how to do that with a nuclear reactor in space? I mean, possibly. I, again, I think we would be more inclined to do it in other ways, but I couldn't rule that out. My sense is the same is probably true of the Chinese. Like if it turned out they were looking at nuclear powered satellites for offensive purposes, I wouldn't be massively surprised. But again, my sense about the Chinese is they absolutely are developing a counter space capability, but I don't think they would be reliant looking at nuclear weapons or nuclear reactors to do that. Though, you know, let me acknowledge there is a ton of uncertainty here. And if I turned out tomorrow I was wrong about that, I wouldn't be massively surprised. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Congressman Turner's decision to release this for just a second. I mean, he seemed to suggest this was an imminent threat that needed to be disclosed right away. Uh, because, I don't know, it was an imminent, imminent threat. With the caveat that we don't know what he knows for sure, I mean, do you agree that this was something that needed to be, you know, immediately declassified and shared with the world? So, it two, again, I keep on saying two thoughts, but two thoughts. Um, this doesn't seem to me more worrying than an awful lot of the stuff the Russian and Chinese or Russia and China and other states are working on. I mean, lots of states are working on a whole bunch of scary capabilities targeted against the United States. Yeah. I assumed it was like a hypersonic missile when, when I saw the initial leak. Uh, it could have. I mean, I, I think my mind probably went in that kind of direction as well. I mean, who knows? But, you know, and to be fair, like the US is working on a bunch of capabilities that are very scary from a Russian and Chinese perspective, to be fair. But like, you know, as I say, this doesn't strike me as uh, posing a, you know, as 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 so far beyond everything else they're working on that it's clear to me exactly why Congressman Turner decided to make a big deal out of this particular program. I would say one could make an argument that I think I probably have some degree of sympathy with that it would be more in the U.S. interest to be generally more open about what adversaries are working on. Um, you know, I, I when one looks at, uh, you know, there was my former boss and, um, you know, former Deputy Secretary of State, now CIA Director, Bill Burns, wrote that lovely piece in Foreign Affairs a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. where he talked about how the US is becoming uh, much smarter about what he called strategic declassification. So declassifying intelligence uh, because it helps advance U.S. foreign policy goals. Right. Yeah. You know, if we think the Russians and Chinese are working on a whole bunch of dangerous, destabilizing stuff, I think it probably is in our interest, not just for the American people domestically, but internationally, to be open, to be more honest about that and talk about these dangerous programs they're working on. Um, but I think the way to do that is to get there is to kind of think strategically about strategic declassification like not just to highlight individual programs that really concern somebody, um, but to kind of make a whole of government decision that we're just going to be more open about dangerous shit, if you'll forgive my French, that China no. and Russia are working on. Yeah, no, dangerous married. Uh, uh, first of all, I love Bill Bur Burns. Uh, we used to call him the stash back in the Obama days, and we just one of my favorite people to work with. I wish I had known that when he was my boss at Carnegie. Not that I would have called him that, but. He's got a great mustache. Um, but also, yeah, no, back in 2009, I remember uh, the Obama administration, it, we declassified a bunch of very sensitive intelligence about a secret Iranian nuclear development facility as part of an effort to get sanctions. Um, two other questions just about Turner's, Congressman Turner's motives. And, and look, this is sort of outside your, your expertise, but I just wonder if you have thoughts. I mean, some people think that he was disclosing this sort of flashy, scary information as a way to maybe rally support for funding for Ukraine. That's plausible to me. The second is about surveillance authorities, because the Washington Post reported that this intelligence was collected using authorities granted by Section 702 of the FISA Amendment Acts. That provision lets U.S. companies surveil on foreign persons uh, outside the U.S. who are using like Gmail, right? So if a Hamas guy is using Gmail, yeah, yeah. we can get that. Um, Congress is debating whether to reauthorize Section 702, so it would seem timely. Uh, do either of those theories seem plausible to you, or is that just speculation? I simply, Tommy, I simply don't know. Yeah. Um, and um, um, 
I, 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 it's probably not helpful for me to massively speculate on this. Like, I just don't. Know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two final very stupid questions. Do you think it would help if we told the Russians that space nukes are too woke? Would that get them to abandon the program? It's about the only thing I can think of that might work with them. Uh, I mean, you could talk about how space nukes pose a danger to Russian children and um, uh, woke and they take drugs. I mean, there you go. It's the best idea I've heard about how to get them get, to get rid of the program. No bad ideas in a brainstorm. And then finally, we obviously don't know the space nukes religion, but does this mean that Marjorie Taylor Greene was onto something? No, no, no. Space nukes and space lasers are a very different technology. Could you power a space laser with a space nuke reactor? You could. And that is a link there I've never made in my own mind before. A nuclear powered space laser. Maybe maybe she was onto something after all. It would be really annoying if she was right this whole time and turns out just to be a genius. Uh, listen, James, this was so interesting and so helpful for me. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. It was fun.